Australia is playing host to one of the world's most well-known environmentalists this week. Dr David Suzuki is in Australia for the launch of his new film, which warns of the need for humans to rethink their relationship with the earth. David Suzuki joins us now in the studio. David Suzuki, good morning and good, good morning. to have you on the program. It's good to be here. Now look, I'm, I'm not trying to bump you off or anything here, but your movie really does sound like something almost like a valedictory speech. Well, it's uh, the, the idea behind it was at the end of a, a career, an academic is often asked to deliver his last lecture. Mm. And so we called it a les legacy lecture, and I delivered it in front of an audience at my university. And it's a chance, I think, for an elder to reflect back on a life and say, well, have I learned anything worthwhile? You know, what do I hope people will consider out of that life? If someone asked me, well, uh, what do you hope people say about you after you're dead? And I said, after I'm dead, I couldn't care less what they say about me, but it would be very nice if a few ideas I had were passed on. And I think as an elder, I really think elders are not playing the role they should be in, in countries like Canada and Australia. Uh, an elder is freed from the, the drive for sex or money or fame or, or power. We're really now able to look at the big picture, think about our grandchildren, and consider, what the heck have I learned in my life? What have, what have you learned about people's changing attitudes to the environment? Well, I, what I've learned is that uh, the environment seems to cycle up and down. In 1988, Australia, as much as the rest of the world, said the environment is a critical issue. I think Paul Keating was the Prime Minister then, and Roz Kelly was the Minister of the Environment. She impressed me very much when I met her. But then, you know, recessions come, and people lose interest, and... What we have to do, I'm debating uh, tonight, uh, is it, why is environmentalism failing? And it is. And the reason is that we're dealing with the environment as if it's a political football. So, oh, the Greens, well, they're the party of the environment. Mm -hmm. Then all the other parties don't have to worry about it. The, the environment should not be a political issue. It's, it comes down to what each of us sees as the important priority. We've got to breathe air or else we're dead. We need clean water. We need clean food that comes from the soil. And yet we treat air, water, and soil as a garbage can and then wonder why health, health costs keep rising. If you treat the earth like a toxic dump, you're treating yourself like a toxic dump. Can I just can I take it, get you to take us through a bit more slowly a couple of those points because there's five or seven fascinating important ideas in there. But the issue of of environmentalism failing, I'm sure, and in the context of the politics you describe, would surprise many people when they say, "But this is the time of, of Greens parties. Greens parties are, are winning more seats everywhere. How can environmentalism well, I, I, be on the decline?" I've talked to Bob about this, and I, you know, thank Bob goodness. Bob Brown, you mean from the Greens? Yes. yes. Thank goodness the Greens have been there, but it shouldn't. I think what we want, need is for all the other parties to say, hey, yeah, those are our issues too, so that the Greens ultimately disappear because everybody is built on the same basic foundation. How can you have air being treated as if it's a political issue, that the Greens care about air and the Conservatives don't care about air? Air keeps us alive, for heaven's sakes, when 15% of children in, in Australia are born with asthma and that rate is climbing. Could it, hmm, have something to do with the fact the moment we're born to the time of our last breath before we die, we're breathing air into our bodies 15 to 40 times a minute and filtering whatever's in the air. And we dump all of our car engine exhausts, all of our chimney exhausts, into that air, right into the lungs of our children. Gee, I wonder why our kids are suffering from asthma. Now, come on, come on folks. It's the same with water. You and I, we're all at least 60% water, for heaven's sakes. And you got to keep topping up all the time because you keep losing it. And we use water to dribble away our toxic waste. I don't get it. That's not rocket science. There, there's still, there is, though, you would have to concede much more of a focus now on, on being more sustainable on, on that front. At the same time, as a highly developed, sophisticated human population on this earth will have to manufacture and will have to emit emissions, will have to create some, some waste and some dirt. We're never going to have a perfectly pristine planet. In nature. One organism's waste is another organism's opportunity. And when an elephant poops on the, on the plains of Africa, believe me, that's a big pile of stuff. Right away, fungi, bacteria, insects jump on it and go, yummy lunch. Now, don't tell me we're not smart enough to try to copy nature. There's a whole area now called biomimicry. What we say is 
that nature's had four billion years to work out solutions to how do you get sex, how do you have a baby, how do you keep from being eaten, what do you do when you get sick, where do you find food? All species have to deal with these problems. Gee, if we copied nature, maybe we would have a lot less problems. And that's all it is, is be humble for heaven's sakes and don't think you're so smart, we're going to overwhelm nature. The, you know, nature has been able to absorb human emissions for most of our existence. It's just that we've now grown so explosively in number and we've got huge technological muscle power that is burning more fossil fuel, blah, 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 and we're creating huge problems. Looking at the ultimate political issue in the environment at the moment, of course, climate change. It's a huge issue here, yes. as you well know. Who's winning? Well, I would say all uh, the delay that's going on, the, the uh, scientists are losing. I think that science is losing out in all of this. You see, 1988, the science was in on climate. People said, we've got to do something. And this isn't about absolute certainty. What scientists say is that the probability is over 90% sure that we're in for real trouble. Well, gee, we, I pay thousands of dollars every year against my car being stolen, against fire in my house. The probability that those things are going to happen to my car or my house is way less than 90%. And yet, I don't begrudge paying that year after year. In Canada, we pay $18 billion a year for defense. The probability Canada is going to need our <laughs> army next year is way less than 90%. We don't begrudge paying that. And yet, with climate, we want 100% certainty. The science is in. What we have seen is the great success of the right-wing think tanks especially in the United States, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, these right-wing think tanks that have been funded heavily. Exxon has led the fossil fuel industry in pouring tens of millions of dollars into campaigns of denial. Oh, this is junk science, this is a natural cycle, the sunspots, all that stuff is being perpetrated by the fossil fuel industry and the, and the right wing, and it's worked. People are more confused now. They think scientists lie. They think that this stuff is exaggeration. And the, the faith in the scientists is dropping, at least in North America. So does the campaign, the crusade, if, if that's a, a way to put it, does it need another generation or another kind of leader or spokesperson? Does it perhaps need an elder to, to fly the flag for the well, argument I mean, again? Well, I'm going to fall off the edge, you know. I mean, I keep going up this ramp, and it's at the end you just go, choom. There's going to have to be, I'm, and I'm very excited, I'm meeting with a, a group of youth, and uh, youth has everything at stake. It's their future. You know, for my, my generation, very little is going to happen really in a catastrophic way. But our children are going to have to live their entire lives in a radically different world. It's no longer about climate change, it's about climate chaos. We are now altering the chemistry and physics of the very planet itself. We're altering the chemistry and physics of air, water, and soil. And no other species has ever done what we've done, especially in such a short period of time. Chaos is looming, and we've got to act now. David Suzuki, a great pleasure to meet you. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Thank, Thank you. you.